Last year, I made a video about the Roman ghosts in York. There were a lot of comments mentioning the stone tape theory. At first, I didn't mind, but then I realised that some of them would talk so confidently, so authoritatively about it as the explanation for the event, but they probably had no idea that it was just made up. So what actually is stone tape theory? Well, it's the idea that historical places can record past events and play them back to people in the form of ghostly experiences. Okay, so how does it work? Well, the, like, vibrations get stored in the stones and then they get replayed back to people as ghostly experiences. Okay, but how does that actually work? Well, I've just said, the stones record these historical events and then when people see ghosts, what they're actually seeing is the playback of these events. Okay, but we're just going in circles here. That's not actually describing how it works. Well, it's just a theory, so you shouldn't be so dismissive then. I'm not a knee-jerk sceptic. I don't instantly dismiss something just because it's supernatural. In fact, as a religious person, I believe in a lot of supernatural stuff. But what this stone tape theory demonstrates is just how easily something can become accepted as fact in popular culture, regardless of how logically coherent it is. Drawing on the ideas of earlier Victorian spiritualists, the first actual use of the term stone tape was in the 1972 BBC film The Stone Tape by Nigel Neal. It's about a group of researchers who travel to an old Victorian mansion which is believed to be haunted. They hypothesise that intense events can become imprinted on a physical location and then replayed under certain circumstances. It was watched by 2.6 million people at original broadcast and galloped into popular culture. Though intended as a work of fiction, it draws heavily on 19th century spiritualist ideas about place memory and residual haunting, the idea that physical places have a sort of emotional memory which could be replayed when certain conditions are met. Unlike traditional hauntings, in which the entity interacts with the person, with residual hauntings, the person is merely a passive witness to the replaying of the event. Like many pop culture concepts, it wasn't invented by the film, but it was certainly popularised by it. The more I think about it, the more disturbed I am by the fact that something that was only intended as a bit of TV entertainment was so readily accepted by the public as veridical fact. In 2018, the brilliant anthology series Inside Number 9 broadcast a Halloween special. I won't give too much away, but basically it used real-life events to create a fictional story about haunted film studios in Manchester. Now, we all know that it's not real. Nobody started talking about the number nine theory. So why did people believe that the stone tape theory was true? Did the thin veneer of historical legacy give it more legitimacy? To put it another way, was it more believable because it had been around for longer? One of the problems with the theory, as presented in the film, is that it doesn't actually explain ghost sightings. It just complicates them with another layer. Something which has been conveniently memory holed is that, in the film, the stone is only a sort of cassette tape which a malevolent spirit is recording and re-recording over. The stone itself can't record. It needs to be acted upon by an external force. It's a bit like having a camera. Obviously it has the ability to record, but it can't record by itself. It needs someone to operate it, to turn it on, press the right buttons. So instead of explaining away the event, all you've done is make it even harder to prove by adding another claim. 
Now you not only need to prove that stones themselves can record and replay past events, but also that a supernatural entity exists and is the one controlling the recording. It's turtles all the way down. Granted, this is just one interpretation of the theory in a fictional work, but it does illustrate a major flaw with the claim. There is no adequate description of its mechanics, how it actually works. It all relies on vague woo about vibrations and physical telepathy. If, as we are led to believe, emotionally charged events become imprinted on the physical surroundings, how does that actually work, considering that emotions are just physical brain chemicals? Why do certain places record events and not others? How are the events stored for centuries in the materials? What triggers a replay? Is my fireplace holding dark secrets? All these questions never get sufficiently answered. It just devolves into a sort of circular reasoning where the definition of the claim gets used to explain how it works. At this point you might be thinking, well, just because we don't understand how it works, it doesn't mean it's not real. And that's certainly true. Gravity was around a long time before Isaac Newton sat under an apple tree. But this isn't really about questioning the validity of supernatural claims. It's about just how easily this stuff becomes part of popular culture and accepted without question. Another problem is emotional priming. People who visit places because they're haunted go in with the expectation that they're going to experience a supernatural event. They've primed themselves for a particular experience, like a stage hypnotist using the power of suggestion. I've spent most of my life visiting castles, houses, museums, graveyards, places which are perfect for centuries of emotional material to reveal themselves. And I have had unusual experiences, feelings of unease, creepiness, but that's because I knew what had happened there. I knew the events that had taken place. The weight of knowledge had created these emotional and physical experiences. Gavin De Becker wrote a book called The Gift of Fear about the subconscious signals that give us that gut feeling that something isn't right. We may not be able to explain why something or someone makes us feel uncomfortable, but our subconscious mind has recognised certain signals and warned us that something isn't quite right. And I think the same principle applies with a lot of supernatural phenomena. Our subconscious brain has recognised certain signals and primed us for a supernatural experience. We may walk into an old timber-framed pub from the 16th century. Our subconscious minds, having noticed the low ceilings, wooden beams, the painted sign, might have connected it with stories we've heard about haunted pubs. The conscious mind is not aware of it, but the subconscious mind has already started thinking about ghosts. All it takes is one shiver or one fleeting glimpse. Ultimately, this video isn't really about disputing supernatural claims. It's about how a TV film from 1972, written as a fairly generic Christmas ghost story, can unintentionally catapult a 19th century pseudoscientific claim into the popular consciousness as accepted explanation for mysterious events. How critical thinking takes a back seat just because something sounds good. How much, I wonder, of our other commonly accepted beliefs are just like this. They might appear logical and sound, but they're actually deeply flawed. Oh, and another thing. Technically, it's not a theory, because a theory is something that can be falsified, i.e. proven right or wrong. Neither is it a hypothesis, because a hypothesis includes a method by which the claim can be falsified, i.e. through experimentation or observation. 
So let's not couch this stone tape business in scientific language to give it a thin veneer of legitimacy. Let's call it what it really is, a pseudoscientific claim, a suggestion, but certainly not a theory. The room holds an image, and when people go in there, they pick it up. What you hear or what you see is inside your own brain. Oh, no. That'd be why the sounds don't echo and why we can't locate them. That'd be why they don't record. No machine hears them. It must act like a recording fixed in the floor and the walls. Right in the substance of them, a trace of what happened in there. And we pick it up. We act as detectors, decoders, amplifiers. A recording? It would have to be in the stone. I wonder some kind of natural process, yeah? But freaky. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps it only occurs under extreme conditions, some kind of extreme human output, emotion, terror, and that prints off.